So our next guest this morning is leading Australian investment banker, corporate advisor, former sports commissioner and philanthropist John Wiley AM. You've had an extraordinary career to date, John. Thanks for your time. You've been involved in businesses of all different varieties for over 40 years now. What's your reading on the current state of the economy? Well, I think these are, in many ways, it's the best of times, but it's also the most dangerous of times. Uh, it's the best of times because uh, all the economic indicators are very positive. Uh, the general economic outlook is, is very good. Obviously, the stock market and financial markets are doing very well, boosted by financial stimulus from, from governments and central banks. So uh, at, a, at a macro level, things are, are, are very good, notwithstanding COVID and all the distress that COVID's caused. Uh, right around the world, but it's also the most dangerous of times because financial markets are pumped up by extraordinary, really unprecedented uh, fiscal and uh, monetary uh, loosening and stimulus. And so that's causing a lot of uh, consequences. It's causing asset price inflation, it's causing uh, a lot of speculation in financial markets in my view, and it's causing a lot of, dis a lot of distortion in financial markets. So it's a time to be optimistic, but to be exceptionally cautious too. Reflecting on the turbulence of the past year, what are the major themes from an investment perspective that will guide your decision making over the short to medium term? Well, we think it's time to uh, be invested. Um, it's uh, the, the, the opportunity cost of not being invested in uh, equity markets in particular in the short term is very high. Um, all of the, uh, the, the likely short term settings for, for financial markets are positive. Uh, obviously, there's the, the spectre of uh, returning inflation that's, uh, that we have to keep an eye on. So we think that both in Australia and internationally, it's a time to invest. Uh, we're certainly investing in our business, but um, it's also a time where there is much, there's increased speculation. And, and there are things, that some of the traditional signs of speculative bubbles in financial markets are starting to emerge. There's, been a big increase in margin debt, there's been a, a significant rise in these what's called uh, SPAC vehicles in the United States which are nothing more than listed cash boxes. Uh, obviously there's been the huge rise in growth of uh, cryptocurrencies, now two trillion dollars US. And, uh, and so in so many ways there's, there's little there's cautionary signs of speculative excess in financial markets. So, so we're investing but we're, we're maintaining a very cautious approach. and, and and, and trying to stay liquid where we can. In your Janu January investment update to your investor base, you mentioned that general investor risk awareness is diminishing. Talk to me about the broader consequences risk complacency can have on markets. Well, it, it's uh, when you get at times of, of almost free money and, uh, and you get ultra loose um, uh, monetary policy and, and, and exceptionally low interest rates, in order for investors to generate alpha and, and generate the, ex, the extra returns, and because leverage is easily available and it's low cost, it does incentivise uh, participants in financial markets to take on leverage, additional leverage. And, uh, and so leverage can build up in the system in ways that is not transparent uh, immediately to uh, even active investors in the market and even to regulators and central bankers. And, you know, go back to the time of the financial crisis in 2008, it was the Queen of England who asked the most pertinent question of all, and she said, why did no one see this coming? And uh, in a way, it feels a similar time now, where uh, we've had, there have just been a couple of warning signs. This uh, Archegos family office that, it, that imploded recently that caused um, Credit Suisse to lose more than 10% of their entire equity base, just one family office. I know, I, I saw a hedge fund in London not so long ago uh, which had a $30 billion net exposure, but a $90 billion gross exposure. They've got $60 billion worth of leverage in their positions. And so very, very small changes in, uh, in financial market conditions, in uh, the, the cost of debt and the availability of debt, uh, could cause quite significant and unanticipated consequences in the times ahead. It, it can flow through, right through the economy, and uh, it can flow through to individuals' behaviours. Uh, so this is a time of exceptional enthusiasm about entrepreneurship and, and the new economy and uh, that's a great thing in so many ways but it's, uh, it's an easy mistake for people to make to assume that paper profits are permanent and, uh, and all too easily you know, lifestyles can start to be funded on the assumption that paper profits are permanent and, uh, and leverage can be assumed and, and so in many ways we've seen this movie in history before. Um, I hope it, it doesn't 
come to grief, but uh, I'm certainly cautious about it. You mentioned in an article recently that Australian capital markets are changing with more ownership of companies in private hands rather than public markets. Talk to me about what you mean by this and, and where you see that trend going. So one thing that we don't celebrate enough in Australia in my view is uh, we have the world's best uh, superannuation system, certainly the world's best compulsory superannuation system. In my view we've got the world's best superannuation system. You look to North America and Europe and uh, they have very large unfunded pension deficits and a structural inability to fund the, uh, the, the lifestyles of, of people in, in retirement years. And Australia, we're fully funded now um, through the, uh, the compulsory superannuation system. So that's causing, a, that's causing a seismic change in the capital markets in Australia, where you see they're starting to see the build up of these very, very large private pools of capital in industry funds and member owned superannuation funds like Sun Super. And so now we have two funds that have approximately $200 billion of, of uh, funds under management, Australian Super and the merged Sun Super and Q Super, and, uh, and many industry funds that are, that are, that are uh, rapidly increasing as well. And the consequences of that are quite profound. Um, it means that there is more patient capital uh, that's available to in, take a long-term investment time horizon to invest in Australian businesses, to provide growth capital on a patient basis, to get out from under the trap of listed equity markets which have become very short-termist and, and uh, really encumbered by a lot of regulation that doesn't always add a lot to economic growth. And, and so um, the, 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 a lot of the most interesting businesses in the economy now can be financed by this private capital, by this long-term patient private capital. And that's fundamentally a good thing for, for the Australian economy. But it means that those, uh, those pools of capital are going to be very powerful in our financial markets and our economy. And, uh, and it's going to potentially diminish the opportunities that are, that are available in the, in the listed market. So it's increasingly impor important for investors to be able to get access to investments through the private market because that's where the most interesting companies will be. And just from your own perspective, you've been extremely active of late, launching over 750 million of new capital for long-term private equity investing in public companies, as well as the launch of a second $500 million credit fund. Where do you see the opportunity for these new funds? So my firm, Tanara, is uh, we are building a diversified alternative asset firm. Uh, we think that uh, there's plenty of precedent for that uh, internationally. We look in Australia and we say, well, that we have the world's best superannuation system, you know, where is the diversified alternative asset firm? And uh, really there's a massive opportunity to build that in, in Australia. So we're doing five things. We're doing venture capital on a global basis. We're doing private equity here in Australia and New Zealand. We're doing private credit, senior secure private credit. We're doing a, a restructuring distressed and stressed debt fund. And we're doing a, a long-term uh, value style, private equity style investment fund in public companies. And what we're doing with, the, uh, with that last one, with the, um, the long-term value type investing in public companies is um, we, think, we think there is a significant gap in the listed markets for investors to take a, a longer term approach, to bring that sort of private equity style philosophy and, and investment mindset to public companies because of these forces of short termism. And, uh, and benchmark hugging, which are which are really um, afflicting of, of public companies, and uh, that struck a very strong chord with investors. And um, uh, we've got very strong backing for our first fund that was seven hundred and seventy million dollars. We'll be raising one point five billion for our second fund. Uh, we've got very good investor interest in that. We've got exceptional alpha on our first fund. And uh, and so, what we're doing with Tanara is. Um, we believe that these changes in capital markets, this, this rise of private capital, is going to, is going to reinforce uh, some of the structural trends that are going on in the markets from, from, from uh, active funds management to passive funds management, which means if you're an active manager, you really have to find sources of alpha. From, uh, from domestic investments to global investments, that's what we're doing in our venture capital portfolio, and we'll be doing additional global strategies over time and from listed to unlisted to, uh, to alternatives. And that's really what we're all about. And, and so we think we're, we're in a very in interesting space in terms of the future direction of Australia's capital markets. Now, it was reported recently that you purchased 5AM yoghurt from PZ Kuzons for a speculated 
figure between, say, 10 to 15 million, we'll call it that. We've previously had the founder of that business, David Pryor, on the program who sold it to PZ originally. What went wrong with that investment, do you think, and how do you think you'll be able to turn it around? Well, I can't talk about what happened under uh, PZ uh, Cousins' ownership, but um, we're very happy to have bought 5AM. It's part of a, uh, a, a, an extension strategy for a business called Barambar Organics that is a, uh, it's got an absolute cult following in, uh, in organic dairy and, and dairy products generally in Australia. It's growing very, very strongly. And uh, so that's enabled, buying 5AM has enabled us to further diversify the footprint and the, uh, and the brand um, ownership of, of Barambar. And so we're building a very, very strong um, uh, organic dairy uh, business here in Australia. And, you know, we think that one of the great trends will be the clean green food uh, trend. We think that's great within Australia. We think there's a massive opportunity internationally. And, uh, and so the combination of those two businesses in that sector is really interesting for us. What we're doing in our private equity portfolio more broadly is where uh, we are generalist investors. We look for growth businesses. We like to invest in, uh, in businesses that need growth capital where there's opportunity to partner with uh, great partners. And, uh, and so we've got investments in uh, the resources industry, in technology for the resources industry, in technology for the healthcare industry, for the retirement aged care centre um, uh, uh, business. We just bought, bought into the number one technology platform for the retirement aged care centre um, sector. And uh, in, um, uh, in customer premises equipment installation around the country for things like solar and all your teleco, teleco needs in the home and, uh, and Barambo Organics, which fits very well into that. So uh, we've just got a very, very interesting uh, growth-oriented private equity portfolio. And before we move on, you've said recently that Seven Group's bid for Boral was highly opportunistic and was a nil premium bid. Tell me more about that. Well, that's uh, our investment in Boral is part of our, our long-term value uh, investment strategy in public companies. And uh, so we bought into Boral at a, at a opportune time and price and uh, we've been very happy that uh, the Boral board has, um, has essentially been um, going down the path that we uh, discussed with them uh, early on when we invested and, um, uh, and so there's been a strong alignment of interests between where we think the best value opportunity is with Boral and uh, what Boral's doing which is to exit from their, from their US operations on advantageous terms and, uh, and to really reinvest in the Australian business in particular, um, where they have, they have a fantastic business with these moat quarries down the east coast of Australia, which are going to benefit from the infrastructure spending boom in Australia over the next 10 years without a shadow of a doubt. So uh, Seven and the Stokes family have been bought into Boral. They have a similar view, we believe, to, uh, to us as on the value opportunity in Boral. And they've acquired a substantial stake and uh, good luck to them. Um, it's, uh, there's, it's a free capital market in Australia and uh, anyone's entitled to make a, a take over bid for another company. Um, we're speaking purely from a perspective of what we think is the right board structure for Boral and, and as a shareholder in the, in the company what we think is a, a, a fair price in, in a change of control context and if someone's making a take over bid then 35 years of experience as an investment banker for me has taught me that they should pay a control premium. But, so we just, we, we we see managing institutional and, and, and uh, family office capital, we believe that we've got a responsibility to speak up and uh, when, we're, when we have a shareholding in companies and uh, advocate our point of view. We don't do it in, a, in an aggress aggressive way. Um, we're not adversarial like US activist investors are. We, we think that's entirely the wrong way to go about it. Uh, we believe in a very collaborative and constructive um, approach with, with public companies and it's working great. Changing themes, I want to briefly talk about your upbringing. You were born in Brisbane in 1961 to Rodney and Nerida Wiley. Talk to me about your parents and some of your earliest childhood memories. Yeah, thanks for reminding me of my birth year. I <laughs> mean, just turned 60. <laughs> uh, so uh, I had a fantastic upbringing. It was great. Uh, it, was, uh, it was just wonderful and uh, had a very uh, loving, close family. I've got two sisters who, st who uh, still live in Brisbane and my dad still lives there. He's 93, he's powering on. And uh, a very close group of friends. It was a very active, sporty kind of environment, um, uh, which gave me habits of, uh, lifelong habits of being active and, and trying to be physically healthy. 
and uh, it was just it was a it was a really great place to to uh, to grow up and and uh, and yeah, it taught me all these great values. Uh, taught me about respect for women and and uh, having good values and family values and the like. So yeah, I was a lucky fella. As a parent to four boys now, how different is Australia today compared to what it was like in the 60s and 70s? Look, Australia's changed. The world's changed. Um, nothing stands still, and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, and Australia, in so many ways, is a better country uh, than what it was then. But as I say, uh, I, grew, I was lucky enough to grow up in, a, in, a, in an environment that was wonderful and, and taught, me, taught me and people around me good values. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, Australia, is a, it's, um, this is the land of opportunity in this country. And uh, I think in the long term, the, the opportunity for Australia is just getting better and better. The opportunity for my kids is, is getting better and better. Um, I think that we're on the cusp of this, this enormous economic opportunity for our country with, um, with the rise of clean energy. I think that's a massive opportunity for Australia. The rise of the digital economy that breaks down the tyranny of distance that used to be such a problem for Australian companies trying to expand offshore. And the rise of Asia and, now, and uh, you know, the fastest growing part of the world, 85% of the world's growth over the next decade will come from directly to our north. And so in many ways, uh, our kids are growing up in a very, very lucky environment here in Australia. I do have uh, some broader sort of existential concerns about the future generation. My generation in so many ways has been the luckiest, I think. Uh, I was um, being born in 61. I was too young to be conscripted into Vietnam and, and uh, uh, you know, lived through the sort of the safety of the Cold War, funnily enough. So we've, been, we've lived in a peaceful time and I hope that remains that way. I hope that the US and China manage to find a way to peacefully coexist in the future. I hope the scourge of nuclear weapons doesn't, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't destroy the world. And uh, I hope that uh, mankind can find a solution to climate change, which I think it's well progressed towards. And, I hope that artificial intelligence, um, which is just going to get sharper and sharper and smarter and smarter, is, is a force for good ultimately, uh, not something else. So that's my, my, in my darker moments, Rob, that's what I, I think about. So following attendance at Brisbane Boys College from 74 to 1978, you enrolled in a Bachelor of Commerce degree at the University of Queensland, where you graduated in 1983 with first class honours. What drove your study interest in that field? My dad was an accountant um, and uh, very involved in, in uh, companies in, in Queensland. And uh, so it was sort of a natural thing uh, from the family background. There were four generations of accountants as my father reminds me, um, and uh, before me, and and so uh, yeah, so that was that was sort of a natural area of interest in finance and commerce and the like, and and yeah, I was, I was very happy I studied that. Yeah. Next came two years studying a Master of Philosophy degree as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University. Take me through some of your best experiences at, at Oxford. What's it like studying there? It's an it's an amazing place. It just uh, completely changed my life going to Oxford. Um, the, uh, first of all, just the, this, it's, it's like this sort of, it, it's, it's like a, someone opens a door and this sort of intellectual, I don't know if a Pandora's box is the word, but, but, it's, but this, this, this amazing cornucopia of intellectual opportunity and challenge opens up uh, in a way that, um, you know, I never saw in my undergraduate days. At the University of Queensland was fantastic, but just the, the diversity of what, what people were studying and, and the like, and, the, and people from all around the world. And, and, uh, and so I met so many fantastic people. I say I, I learned as much from the students there as I did from my, my uh, course. I, uh, and I formed lifelong friendships and relationships and I bumped into some pretty interesting people <laughs> while I was there, both Australians and people overseas. I had uh, Boris Johnson in my rugby team, which was entertaining. He was a, quite an amusing fellow even then. So. As I understand it, your father was fond of saying doors are always open, whether or not you walk through them is up to you. Following your education at Oxford, you did indeed walk through one of your first doors, which was at Hill Samuel & Co. Talk to me about that time in, in your life. So, uh, yeah, when I left Oxford, I uh, went on what's called the Milk Round, uh, which is students coming down from Oxford and Cambridge and the other universities in the UK going to firms in, this, in the city of London. And it was all the old British merchant banking firms, so uh, S.G. Warburg, Kleinwort Benson, 
Morgan Grenfell, Hill Samuel, they're all, they're all the great names of the city. And uh, I applied to nine firms and I got one offer, which was Hill Samuel, and uh, that was the last one. And so I got a position there as a graduate int uh, intake trainee, 9,000 pounds a year, um, and I was so happy to get that role. And I couldn't have been luckier. It was a great firm. Hill Samuel, of course, owned a, a business called Hill Samuel Australia, which we worked on the spin-off of while I was there. And we decided it was decided to rename it Macquarie Bank. And uh, so we actually spun off Macquarie while we were there. Should have become a shareholder, but I didn't. Um, and uh, uh, it was just a wonderful time. This was Thatcher's England, and um, uh, there was what's called Big Bang in the city of London in 1986, which deregulated the financial markets there. And this was part of this 25-year thematic that, that uh, drove the financial markets in a really positive way, an opportunity in the financial markets for people like me, um, all the way through to the financial crisis of 2008. Um, and uh, so I was just, I got in the ground floor really of the, the, the development of merchant banks and investment banks internationally. In 1987, you then moved to New York and worked for First Boston. What's it like working on Wall Street and what was it like working on Wall Street, particularly in the late 80s? It was amazing. And, and when I think back about the time now, about what it was like then, uh, it's like looking at a movie. I mean, it's, it is just a completely different world. Um, so I started at, at uh, First Boston on Black Monday um, when the stock market was down 25%. I thought I was going to have, go into Wall Street history as having the, the shortest career in, in Wall Street history. I survived. The, the, I stayed there till 1991. The next four years were amazing. Um, the, uh, the markets bounced back very quickly. Uh, the whole leverage buyout boom really took off. While I was there, there was the what was then a record uh, leverage buyout. The a number of investment banks put together bids for RJR Nabisco. First Boston was central in that. And. Uh, I had the, the great opportunity to work for two legends on Wall Street uh, for a brief period of time, um, Bruce Wasserstein and Joe Perella. And uh, it was, it was, they, Wasserstein invented the mergers and acquisitions business. It didn't exist uh, before the mid 80s. And uh, the experience that you got on Wall Street, uh, really one of those investment banks was equivalent to, to 10 years of experience in the Australian market, I said. It was brutal, it was basically 24-7 uh, without any questions being asked by, by anybody. That was the expectation. And they had a habit of basically firing 10% of the staff every, every six or 12 months. And uh, so you had to keep your head down and work hard <laughs> and add value. Um, but I was happy to survive. And next came uh, your relocation to Melbourne in 1991, where you, wherein you worked for Credit Suisse First Boston, I think, until late 1999. During this time, you worked on a number of deals, including the asset privatisation for Qantas, as well as the power industry for the Kennett government. What are the benefits of privatisation, in your view? Look, uh, privatisation, um, the benefits of it depend on how it's done in so many ways. Um, I always say there's three tests for a successful privatisation. Uh, was it a, first and foremost, was it a policy success? Uh, secondly, was it a financial success? And thirdly, was it a political success? In the 90s, when we privatised the electricity and gas system here in Victoria, it was all three. It was, I regarded it as the most successful privatisation program anywhere in the world, um, and certainly in Australia. The um, Subsequent to that, you know, the energy market has just changed so profoundly and there were some steps that were taken to allow um, or to, to relax some of the cross-ownership restrictions that we put in place at the time of, of, uh, of sale to, to enforce diversity that were relaxed that maybe with the benefit of hindsight shouldn't, that shouldn't have happened. But that privatisation was, was very, very successful. Um, the, uh, there are other privatisations where they've been, they've been much less successful. If you transfer a, a public monopoly to a private monopoly, the, 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 the economic benefit and the public policy benefit of that is much less significant and, and you create a whole new set of incentives for a private monopoly to, to profit maximise in ways that don't necessarily serve the public's interest. So it really depends. I've seen a lot of privatisations and I, it, a lot of it, it really depends on how it's done. 
Next came the launch of Carnegie Wiley with fellow Oxford alumni Mark Carnegie. Fast forwarding to 2007 when you sold the business to Lazar. When you reflect on that six or seven years that you worked with Mark and, and had Carnegie Wiley, what were the, some of the highlights and, and some of the best deals that you recall? So Mark and I dated back to Oxford together. Um, we started in business in 2000. Uh, it was a long Friday lunch and Mark said, why don't, we, why don't we go into business together? I said, okay, I couldn't think of a decent reason. <laughs> it was three o'clock. Um, uh, but it was fantastic. It was, it was just a life-changing experience for me. I learned a huge amount from Mark. He's a very, very good investor. Um, I learned a lot about the principles of investing, about some of the you know, cognitive biases that, that uh, can affect you in, in your inv investment decisions. Um, about yeah, and about sort of dynamics in, in investment decision processes, and so we built this business. It was uh, it was a combination of private equity and corporate advisory. Mark, before we went into business, was the representative for Hellman and Friedman in Australia. The private equity industry in the late 90s didn't really exist here, um, and uh, and so he really had a very strong position in private equity. And I'd been running Credit Suisse first Boston in Australia for a number of years at that stage. And so we felt there was a re really good combination of the two. Over time, what we did, we, we, we raised one significant private equity fund with Sun Super as our initial backer. We made a number of investments in that. Probably the, the uh, most successful and, and significant was an investment in Dun & Bradstreet Australia, um, which uh, we sold for about four times our money. Um, we bought in 2006. And, um, but we also did a lot of corporate advisory and, and of course those years 2000 to 2007 were M&A boom years. We were independent advisors, um, independent of the major investment banks and there was a very strong market appetite for ind independent advice. So our business took off and, uh, and it was just, it was a joy and, and uh, we were, yeah, we were, we were, it was a great partnership and, and then Lazard uh, came along in 2007 and wanted to build their Australian presence. And of course, who was running Lazard at the time was, was Bruce Wasserstein and, and uh, supported by a guy called Chuck Ward, both of whom I worked with at First Boston in the 80s. And so that facilitated things. So I think you stayed on at Lazard until some point in 2014 before launching Tanara Capital, of which you're the founder and CEO of today. Why did you stay on that long? And, and I guess the second part is, why did you go out and, and start your own business? Was it just the need to have a, a independence back again? Well, there are a few reasons. Uh, the, the, um, when I sold the business to Lazard, uh, it was a four-year contract. Um, so that was through to 2011. I got to 2011 and I felt that um, there was still work to do to, to build up the internal succession in the place. And, uh, and it was really important to me that the, the business not only survived but flourished after I left. And, uh, and so I wanted to make sure that it had that sort of institutional stability. There's been quite a lot of examples of, of independent financial firms being acquired by larger firms, international firms in Australia. It lasts a very short period of time and then it all blows up because they're, they're, they're people businesses. And so I wanted it, the, the story of Carnegie Wiley and Lazard to be different. And so that's why I stayed around and, and we achieved that. And I was very happy when uh, Andrew Layden had worked with me for a number of years, took over as CEO of Lazard Australia. We had a great uh, name change campaign from what was called Lazard Carnegie Wiley, where we had the three names on the website and then Wiley dropped off and Carnegie dropped off. And then we had underneath it name droppers. <laughs> um, so uh, that was the reason for staying as long as I did. Um, and. Uh, uh, but, uh, but also, by the time uh, 2015 rolled around, you know, I was uh, in my 50s and, and uh, you know, investment banking is a young person's game, you know, it's, 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 it's just on the whole time. And I've always enjoyed investing. I, 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 you know, you get a certain amount of satisfaction out of being an advisor, but, you know, you advise and other people make decisions. And I felt that from my experience with Mark at, at Carnegie Wiley and my personal investment experience that, that I had the ability to myself but also to attract a team of good investors to be a very successful investment firm. 
One of the divisions of the business today, as I understand it, is the long-term value division or long-term value emphasis, wherein you work with board and management over a three to five year time frame. What sort of advice and involvement do you provide to these companies to generate a better return? We, we try to have to be people who have the engagement style of an investment banker or, or a management consultant, uh, but the economic interests of a shareholder. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, as Charlie Munger said, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. And there's a lot of very smart and capable and ethical people working in investment banks, but when the, the incentive structures are all about transaction fees, they're incentivised to see companies do transactions. And, and you know, there's a large body of evidence that, that a lot of M&A does not add value for, for the companies. In fact, quite often it, it destroys value. And, uh, and so we, we think that the, this, this uh, uh, dealing with companies where you are, are a shareholder, but you try to provide that, that, that advice and the set of skills that we have after we buy a shareholding is, is a really interesting and, and valuable and unique place to be. And very few people can do it. And, uh, and so we've, we've assembled an, an exceptional team here at, at um, Tanara doing this. And uh, our first fund has generated 17% alpha over benchmark to date. Um, we feel there's a lot more opportunity in the, in the companies we've invested in. And uh, for the reasons I was talking earlier about the rise of short-termism on, on public companies, combined with the fact that, that, that the active funds management industry is being hollowed out in so many ways, and so a lot of the active fund managers who used to talk to public companies are now diminishing and it's becoming more a passive market. Um, we think that that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting and differentiated space to play in. And right across the business, has your investment methodology or mandate changed as a result of COVID? Not really. Um, we, uh, we started our, our long-term value fund in December 2019. And uh, so we were doing a lot of research on companies early on. In a way, the, the, the market break in March 2020, um, between February 20th and March 23rd, when the market went down by 40%, that was an epic buying opportunity for us. And, and we'd done the research on companies. And so we sort of backed up the truck and, and bought some significant stakes at the time. And, and that's been very successful for us. And that's really, in many ways, underpinned the, the returns on the first fund. But it hasn't changed our, our fundamental style. We, we do think that um, it's created an opportunity for a uh, debt recovery, debt restructuring fund, um, which we're in the process of launching right now with Ian Carson and Lindsay Maxted, two of Australia's foremost uh, restructuring advisors over decades, along with a, a gentleman, Michael Phillip, because we believe that uh, there will be sectors of the economy, notwithstanding the fact there's been this enormous stimulus, there'll be sectors of the economy that will still have issues recovering from, from COVID, um, particularly in export exposed sectors like tourism and and uh, education, and uh, and then there'll be sectors of the economy that'll be impacted by trade disputes with China, for example, um, where they'll need some additional capital or restructuring of their debt. So we're launching a $300 million debt restructuring fund at the moment as a fifth platform for Tanara. I could pick your mind all, all morning, but just in the interest of time, a couple of quick questions to finish. On a local level, you were vocal last year about the need for Victoria to become a lower taxing state to recover from the pandemic. We've seen the budget being handed down, I believe, tomorrow. There's been a lot of talk, particularly with regard to tax increases for property developers and, and people in the property industry. Um, how would you evaluate Victoria's attractiveness as compared with, say, somewhere like New South Wales? Well, Victoria, it's been, it's been the miracle economy in so many ways uh, since I got here. I, got, I arrived here in, in May of 1991 and this place was in a depression. It was, I'll never forget my first day walking up Collins Street and all of the, sh the boarded up shops and the sort of pop-up art galleries in this. And, uh, you know, the Victorian economy historically was, the, the foundation of it was brown coal fueled, subsidised manufacturing, cheap manufacturing. And, and of course, uh, you know, the, the transition to clean energy and the rise of Asian economies has changed everything. And the Victorian economy has transitioned seamlessly to, and been, it's been the fastest growing state, um, uh, you know, over the last 10 years through the rise of the service, service industries and the knowledge economy. And so 
I've been lucky enough to be president of the State Library here in Melbourne for the last nine years. We're the central servicing hub for the international education market and uh, that needs to recover. But I think Victoria's got great prospects. You know, we are a knowledge economy in, in, in a, a knowledge society in a knowledge economy in the 21st century. Um, uh, population growth and, and uh, migration growth will recover. Um, I do believe that Victoria needs to uh, try to be a low tax regime uh, and, and I think that's an important thing. Uh, there's, there'll be measures they need to take to restore the budget in the short term but in the long term you want to drive costs out of government services in order to be a low, a low taxing jurisdiction to attract businesses to come here. Super important. And then there's the odd infrastructure project like a fast rail network to the uh, to the airport, which is I, I regard as absolutely essential, but pleasingly they're going to do that. What have been your biggest learnings throughout your career and what advice can you share to those watching? I'm always, uh, I am always say that advice is worth what you pay for it, Rob, which <laughs> so be careful. Um, look, I gave a speech the other day to uh, uh, to a group and, and said, uh, I'm, in many ways I'm an, I'm an accidental risk taker. Um, I, I grew up in a, in a wonderful but, but conventional and, and conservative upbringing and so I wasn't a natural risk taker. And I learnt it um, really by just the dint of circumstance in life, uh, encouraged by people like Mark Carnegie and, and it's, it's paid huge rewards for me in my career. Um, taking personal risk in, in, in career decisions. Uh, you know, when I went to first Boston in New York, there was quite a lot of pressure to come back to Australia and, and uh, work for a local bank at the time. And uh, the, the number one message I'd give is, is um, the benefits of, of prudent risk taking. Um, you need to protect your downside, but, but, but uh, position for the upside. And I think that's a message that's important personally. Uh, I think it's a message for Australia too. That, um, you know, we've got an amazing opportunity in this country over the next 20 years with, um, if we're ambitious and, and we're willing to take some risks and, and you know, if our businesses are, are game enough to really try to expand into Asia and uh, accelerate the transition to clean energy economy and, and uh, take advantage of all our smarts coming out of, coming out of our universities. I think that's, that's a really important opportunity set for us. And then, you know, the other thing I've, I've learned in my journey is um, the, the importance of personal integrity, uh, people can trust you over time. The reason I've assembled this team at Tanara now is because I think a lot of people uh, have learned to trust me in, in the markets over, over decades. Um, yeah, and, and, and being, being fair to people and, um, and, and, and building good teams is, it's, it's, yeah, it's been, it makes life enjoyable apart from um, hopefully having a successful business. Second last question, how would you evaluate the state of Australian sport in light of your previous role as Chair of Australian Sports Commission, now Sports Australia, and what sort of position are we in heading into the Tokyo Olympics, do you think, if they do go ahead? Well, I think uh, Australia has got a lot to celebrate about uh, our sports, men and women and, and uh, boys and girls. I think it's, it's, it's such a part of our DNA. and. It's something that makes us massively proud and, and sends all sorts of good messages to the to the community. The uh, the world of uh, the global world of sport is becoming much more competitive. Uh, a lot of countries now are attracted by the soft power and the and the, the cultural values of of uh, sporting success and and want to see their athletes on the top of the podium um, in Olympic games and Paralympic games. So it's become tougher for Australia and. Um, so we've got rising global competition. Domestically here in Australia, we've got uh, more competition and choice. And so the rise of women's sport here in Australia is a fantastic thing in so many ways. But the, the fact there's now AFLW and there's women's soccer and there's WBBL in cricket means there's so many more choices now for female athletes than there was previously. And so that's going to put competition on the long-term uh, talent pool for Olympic uh, sports in particular. And so the, the, the task is getting tougher for Olympic, Olympic sports. I think Australia will do very well at, at the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, I really, I, I believe they'll go ahead. I really hope they go ahead for the sake of the athletes. I've been amazed by the, the it's just inspirational what these kids do. I mean, for Kate Campbell, who vowed after Rio that she was going to, going to uh, you know, get to the top of the podium 
in Tokyo. She's been going up and down a pool for five years, for a couple of hours a day at least. Um, the dedication of these kids is incredible. And, uh, and so I hope for the sake of the athletes they get their chance in Tokyo. And if they do, I think Australia will do very well. But it's just it's getting tougher and tougher every, every Olympic Games. And My final question is, you're heavily involved in the philanthropic sector, as I mentioned earlier, via your own foundation and via the Tanara philanthropic business. Which causes are you focusing most of your attention on at the moment? So with uh, the foundation that I've got, uh, with my, my wife Miriam, uh, we focus on um, uh, youth well-being, on education, on indigenous opportunity, on social inclusion, uh, on sport of well-being, and on particular community interests. Uh, Miriam is the honorary consul general for France in Victoria, so we do it for the French community, and uh, so it's quite broad. Um, but it, but we do try to define it in particular pillars and areas of, of particular opportunity. Um, we, uh, we do say that we like to uh, make an impact and not a statement, um, so we're not looking to get out there and toot our horn, we're just trying to, trying to uh, you know, make, a, make a contribution. Australia and, and Victoria and Melbourne in particular have been enormously good to us and our family and uh, you know, we like to give back to the community and try to reinvest in the community that's been so good to us. And, do things for people who, are, who have uh, had less opportunity or uh, less advantage than us. Um, we also, through Tanara, we've got this sidebar called Tanara Philanthropic Advisors. And the, where that came from is um, we said that, look, we have all these skills, investment skills, uh, advisory skills that we've developed in the corporate world over years. Um, the directors of charities and, and CEOs of charities quite often don't have access to the advice that you do in the, in the private sector. And so we said there's an opportunity to provide that investment, that, those investment skills and perspectives and advice to charity organisations and to do it pro bono. Um, so we're not trying to sell them something, but we're saying, look, if you want some advice and how to, how to understand how investors would think about things, we're happy to do that. And so we set up this, this uh, philanthropic advisory organisations led by fabulous lady Lisa Kingman and uh, Tom Ford who's part of our team. Everyone in our team gets involved in it. Uh, they all do one or two projects a year advising charities. We've advised about 50 charities now and and it's just great. You know, we, we, it's immensely rewarding for us. It's good for the team. Uh, it gives the team, as, uh, quite apart from what we do in investing, it gives the team a sense of social purpose and social contribution. And we think the charities appreciate it and we're not trying to charge them anything. So um, we think it's possibly the greatest multiplier benefit we can bring. It's more than cash for these organisations. Well, John Wiley, not only one of the great business people, but also a great philanthropist and, and a generally just a great person. Thanks for your time this morning. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it, mate.